History and Freedom by Theodore Adorno. Uh, This is Lecture 4, The Concept of Mediation, November 19th, 1964. Ladies and gentlemen, you will have noticed that the explanation I have given you of the nature of the history of philosophy has taken a somewhat paradoxical form. The paradox is that the kind of speculative thought of which positivism has accused the philosophy of history has become a kind of necessity. This is because the facts that have been advanced as a counterweight to mere illusion have themselves become a sort of cloak and so reinforce the impression of mere illusion. In the last lecture, I gave you the the necessary qualifications about this in my apologia for immediacy. But I should now like to give you a more detailed explanation of the view I put forward then so as to provide you with an imminent critique of positivism that is to say a critique of positivism on positive positivist assumptions by this i mean the attempt to comprehend what is actually essential while rejecting or restricting the concept of the fact itself above all i should like to make the concept of facts more concrete for once you decide to reject the customary distinction between the so-called universal structures treated by philosophy in the concrete historical event, you commit yourself to an obligation to enter into the spirit of these events. Hegel honored this obligation in exemplary fashion, and if I am unable to follow in his footsteps, that is because I have to communicate certain fundamental ideas, not because I am lapsing into idealism as far as the form of thought is concerned, while disputing it in terms of its content. So the fact that facts become a mere cloak is itself a function of the growing power of the totality, which imperceptibly reduces the facts to epiphenomena. By this I mean that the more a true dialectic between the universal and the particular is reduced in the world we live in today, and the more the particular is defined as a mere object belonging to the universal without being able to affect it reciprocally, then the more the so-called facts become a mere cloak veiling what really exists. And by facts here, I mean the individual both in his understanding of himself and in his effect on another mind. In this context, I may perhaps refer you to my essay, Titles, in Volume 2 of the Notes to Literature, where I discuss this motion of the concrete to mere illusion as compared with the universal. This will spare me the necessity of expounding the idea as fully as it doubtless deserves. And if you do look it up, it will leave me with the space to do rather more justice to the subject matter of these lectures if I need to mention only those matters that I have not discussed elsewhere. And if I can refer you to already existing publications that can reinforce what I have to say here. This is the only reason I am doing it, and not because I think it essential for you to have read every sentence I have written. Someone like Karl Kraus could justifiably make such a demand, but it would be sheer arrogance for me to do likewise. So what I think is that only speculation which can penetrate external reality and show what really and truly lies behind the facade of facticity that is asserting itself can be said to do justice to reality to use a phrase originating in psychoanalysis. The only way to capture reality and the true experience of it is to go beyond the immediate givens of experience. In this sense, we can say that speculation remains an aspect of experience. I shall explain, I shall explain this to you as follows. If you have ever had to serve on committees on whom important decisions depend or are thought to depend, You will see how the worst and the basest instincts prevail over the better, more humane ones. I should perhaps say that you will perceive this unless you completely identify with what is going on and subscribe to its principles. This is a basic experience, even though you will not see a simple confrontation between the best and the worst, but rather an infinitely nuanced chain of individual decisions, proposals, and processes that focus initially at least on topics that seem utterly remote from such global judgments. Nevertheless, in questions involving individuals, there is an overwhelming tendency, not so much for the worst speech to triumph over the better one, but for the worst man to be appointed to the position that should have gone to the better one.
And this is a common experience that has to be faced up to as frankly as any other experience. And only a concept of experience that is restricted in advance will enable you to avert your gaze from such events by focusing on the immediate matters under discussion. Needless to say, it is not helpful to dwell on such experiences. We have to go beyond them and ask how we can persuade others and ourselves that such things really do happen and that you yourselves will have seen them happen once you have dis disabused yourselves of the illusions attendant upon such processes. And if you have not experienced such things already because you have had the good fortune not to serve on any committees, then I fear I shall have to disillusion you because I predict that one day you will all remember my words on this subject. Unless you succeed in repressing them, something I should like very much to prevent. To explain this further, I should like to bring to your attention a number of concrete considerations. In the first place, the better course of action is in general the more productive one, the more innovative one, the course of action that does not fit in with established opinion, to say nothing of established group opinion. As such, it is suspect from the outset, particularly where there are groups in a more or less settled consensus. The resistance of the better way to a conformist view is almost always compromised by the fact that it compromised compromised by the fact that it appears to contravene some pre-existing rule or other. Take the example of a young scholar whose promotion is up for discussion, as they say. If he is really able, if he has opinions of his own, and is not simply a careerist, and if he retains his intellectual independence from whatever happens to him, then when he comes to write reviews, he will not write <clears throat> that this or that book is a valuable contribution to a particular branch of learning, as is almost universally the case in the current critical anarchy. Instead, he will decline to mince his words when criticism is warranted, and he will not shrink from saying that a dull, unintelligent book is dull and unintelligent. This will instantly expose him to the rebuke that his polemical tone is improper, that it is incompatible with the academic tradition and God knows what else. And in committees, such, a, such objections will generally find a willing ear. Anyone who beha behaves in such a deviant manner will have compromised himself by the mere form of his deviation. Those of you who are doing your teaching practice and take part in staff meetings will have plenty of stories of your own to, conform, or to confirm what I have been saying. A further factor is that, for reasons I cannot go into now, anyone who deviates from the consensus is not only in a superior position to what he opposes, but also in an inferior one in certain respects. This is partly because the support structures for a lone opponent are always more flimsy than for the compact majority. I have given a very circumstantial account of this in my introduction to the sociology of music, where I analyze what is thought of as official music life. But I believe that what I am talking about is a very widespread phenomenon. Perhaps I may insert here a few words about methodology. In formal terms, these remarks may remind you a little of what is generally thought of as formal sociology. You will find similar discussions in certain works by George Simmel, such as the philosophy of money or the so-called great sociology. The only difference is that when I make such such social, the only difference is that when I make such sociological points, they only appear to be formal in nature. The social structures I am referring to are indeed phenomena with formal characteristics, but if one were to look at a look a little deeper, certain social realities would come into view, such as the fact that ideas are being controlled by the socially dominant groups in power, at at any given moment or at any given time. Formal sociology and, by the same token, the formal structure of history are legitimate because they seem to operate with formal categories that remain constant and are continually encountered regardless of their social content. In reality, however, these formal categories are filled with a sedimented content that conceals the dominant relations and the dominance of the universal that forms the subject of our reflections on the philosophy of history. To return to the question of nonconformists, 
people who want things to continue as they are and who resist the introduction of alternatives are incredibly sensitive to this weakness in the, in the advocates of change. The voices of the majority are no more than the echo of current opinion. And when they lean back in their chairs and give vent to what they imagine to be their own ideas, they merely reproduce the bleeding of the many. I think that you cannot picture vividly enough just how sensitive such people are to any signs of difference. And that is what is, mu that is, what is such a matter of concern in what I am telling you. So here you have an example of the way in which the universal succeeds in getting its own way. The situation is that when such touchy matters are at stake as those we are discussing at this moment, individuals may act unconsciously as zoon polit politikon, as social beings, as the organs of social control. But as the functionaries of universal opinion, they will evince a degree of intelligence that I sometimes think is astronomically greater than anything the individual can muster. The consequence is that anyone who desires change is always in the wrong vis-a-vis -vis this concentrated intelligence of the collective. I must emphasize that in this situation we are not talking about a lack of goodwill and those who resist improvements, or not necessarily so. Rather, we can really perceive here something of the objectivity on which Hegel insists so emphatically in opposition to the merely subjective mind. Subjectively, they almost always act with the best of intentions, almost always may be a little optimistic. Perhaps I should say that subjectively, they frequently act with the best of intentions, or they rationalize their intentions by arguing that they are acting only in the interests of the institution or the collective which they happen to represent at that moment. Intrigues then regularly put in an appearance, and that too seems to be an obligatory feature but they can be thought of as an extra over and above the negative world spirit that is asserting itself. An example of this can be seen in the victory of fascism, which really was part of the objective trend in 1933, but which could be said to have been reinforced or promoted by a backstairs conspiracy in the house of a Cologne banker. It would be rewarding for such a formal philosophy of history or sociology, albeit of a slightly different kind than it is to be found in the than is to be found in the textbooks. To explore, do this. to explore, sorry, it would be rewarding for such a formal philosophy of history or sociology, albeit of a slightly different kind than is to be found in textbooks, to explore further this additional role of what might be called a specious individuation, which appropriates the objective disaster for its own advantage and reinforces it. Circumstances like these cannot be reduced to the totality of their various mediations. And in that sense, they can never be made fully transparent as indeed I am suggesting to you. I believe that you can clarify them for yourselves to a certain extent, by reflecting that groups of the kind I have been discussing are reflections of the totality of the universe. This is a theme that my former pupil, Mengold, has argued very persuasively in his volume on group discussions. In other words, conflict situations inevitably lead to acquiescence in the opinions of the group, and in such committees or restricted groups, this acquiescence involves translating the general process of social adaptation into the specific situation. This is not to assert that these general processes of adaptation are no more than a symphony of such concrete group adapt adaptations. That would be a far too innocent interpretation of the situation. In fact, the reverse is the case. In reality, the driving impetus, the thing that actually acts, is a far larger, more anonymous force. It consists of the dominant attitudes of society as a whole, attitudes that are difficult to grasp hold of, but which unconsciously determine and give shape to group opinions into which the group then adapts itself. These committees I have been speaking of are typical examples of such group opinions, but I could give you countless others. We may say then that global social relations reproduce themselves here at the micro level in the way in which deviants and nonconformists relate to the committees or groups with which they come into conflict. That is the situation, rather than the opposite scenario in which the totality of these groups are what comp 
what comprise society as a whole. In the same way, the ideologies that are advocated in such groups and provide the basis for the phenomenon I have tried to explain to you are not confined to these groups. They are framed in such universal terms and possess such an abstract generality in comparison to the plethora of group opinions that this fact alone makes it implausible that the universe of group opinion or public opinion should emerge as a, as a synthesis of the concrete attitudes of the group. I hope now that I have been able to give you a more easily comprehensible idea of what I have called the prevailing universal, and I would add that my remarks do not just hold good for questions involving personnel, but are relevant to much more far-reaching decisions, economic decisions, for example, in the most influential controlling committees. I should now like to try and explain more concretely the complex issues involved in mediating between the universal and the particular a question I have discussed up to now, only on the level of the universal. Perhaps I can illustrate this with reference to a historical issue, since this might well seem appropriate in discussing a theory of history that sets out to comprehend history and not simply to chronicle it, while at the same time resisting the temptation to impute to history a positive meaning. This contradiction as I have now once again formulated it, is actually, and I would like to remind you of this, what I intend to explore in these lectures, or at any rate in the first part of them, and to do so to the best of my ability. To illustrate what I mean, I would like to say something about the French Revolution, the so-called Great French Revolution of 1789, and the problems it presents us with for an understanding of history. The first point to make is that in this revolution, the political forms taken by the economic emancipation of the middle class were adapted to the principle of liberalism, by which I mean an uninhibited entrepreneurialism organized into nation states. This revolution then was part of the great process of the emancipation of the middle class, and that in turn dates back, as you all know, to the emancipation of the city-states of the Renaissance. This process continued chiefly in England during the 17th century and in France in the 18th. I probably have no need to tell you about this process of emancipation, except for the slight reservation I have about the so-called rise of the middle class that is more or less automatically associated with it. The question whether the middle class did in fact rise as a consequence of its increasing power is one that cannot be answered as unambiguously by a critical theory as it is by bourgeois ideology itself. At all events, at the same or at the time when the great French Revolution broke out, the crucial economic levers were already in the hands of the middle class. This means that production was already under the control of the manufacturing and the incipient industrial middle class. At the same time, as was pointed out by Saint Simon, the great sociologist of the day, the feudal class and the groups associated with it in the absolutist system had ceased almost entirely to have any influence over production in the sense of socially useful labor. This weakness of the absolutist system was the precondition for the outbreak of the revolution, and it will be difficult to deny, particularly in the light of more recent research, that what appeared in the self-glorifying accounts of bourgeois historiography to be an indescribable indescribable act of liberation was in reality more like the confirmation of an already existing situation. Nietzsche's dictum in Zarathustra that you should give a push to whatever is already falling is a classical bourgeois maxim. That is to say, it contains the idea that bourgeois actions are almost always of the kind that are covered by the dominant universal by the universal historical principle that is in the process of asserting itself. And this is connected with the fact that because all bourgeois revolutions merely make official or de jour something that already existed de facto, they all have an element of illusion, of ideology about them. This is an insight developed very perceptively for our understanding of the bourgeois freedom movement by Horkheimer in his essay, Egoism and Freedom Movements, which at long last is soon to be made available again. On the other hand, what I have called the great process which led to something like the takeover by the middle class and the French Revolution 
would not have been conceivable without notorious mismanagement by the absolutist rulers of France. I am thinking here of the intractable, intractable problems of the budget and the financial crises which physiocrat reformers such as Kesne, who as you know was close to Turgot, strove in vain to resolve. Without this specific basis in fact, namely the evident inability of the absolutist regime to align its own understanding of the economy with the current state of the forces of production, things would never have reached the point of revolt, let alone the mass uprising of the initial phase. During those first critical years, the genuine sufferings of the quasi-proletarian urban masses of Paris were the precondition for the revolutionary movement. And to a certain degree, these masses spontaneously sustained that movement and contributed to the increasing radicalization of what was essentially a middle class phenomenon. That such a negative factor was a necessary precondition can also be seen from the contrast with other countries in the same period where bourgeois liberal and national tendencies established themselves, but without provoking a revolutionary uprising. We may even say that comparable trends made their appearance in Germany during the following decades, despite its economic backwardness. Moreover, similar tendencies can be observed in our own day, and the way in which the non-totalitarian nations have come to adopt some of the structural forms of the administered world. I do not wish to sound pompous, but the vulgar distinction between the underlying cause and the proximate cause a distinction which may be familiar to you from school, may, fatuous though it may seem, have something to do with the difference between the objective process and the specific condition that triggers it. An underlying cause is the element that is crystallized in the global social process that tends to take over everything else. This tendency to annex everything, even where the individual components seem to diverge or to have nothing in common, with the overall process is a phenomenon that can be observed even today and that is a contradiction or sorry and that is a contribution that empirical sociology can make to the philosophy of history it is quite certain that the bombing of german cities during the last war was in no sense intended to contribute to slum clearance the americanization of the city or other sanitation measures in its effects however no doubt because they were more inflammable the older in part medieval town centers could be more easily destroyed, the bombing did result in that growing similarity of German towns to American ones. This is all the more striking because we cannot assume that this was part of any so-called historical trend. Or to take another example, it has been observed and, and much has been made of the fact that the so-called refugee families have resisted the general tendencies undermining the traditional stability of the family. In contrast to this, empirical sociology has produced ample evidence that, despite these countervailing tendencies which emerged towards the end of the war and shortly after it, the statistics show that the most important elements of that anti-family trend, namely the increase in the divorce rate and the number of so-called incomplete families, have continued unabated. It was the achievement of my colleague Gerhard Baumer who tragically died young to have pointed this out. Thus you may see from these two examples how the larger trends relate to the so-called immediate facts. You should bear in mind, however, that so-called proximate causes such as Louis the 16th's bankrupt financial policy represent the element of immediacy without which there could be no mediation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I have just told you that, despite my attempt to salvage the schoolmasterly distinction between underlying cause and proximate cause, this distinction, this philosophical distinction, still remains a fatuous, fatuous element, even if no attempt is made to account for its significance. I should like to come back to this by pointing to a third aspect of the French Revolution, one with a bearing on the relation between underlying cause and proximate cause, if I may continue to use these terms. No doubt these elements are to be differentiated, but the distinction I have drawn is and remains superficial. The two concepts are mediated in themselves. More specifically, throughout the whole of history as it is known to us, 
They are mediated in the sense that the universal, i.e. the underlying cause, takes precedence over the proximate cause. To explain this in more concrete terms, the mismanagement that triggered the French Revolution is not a matter of chance, a contingent fact, independent of the historical process. It was determined by the global situation. In the first instance, it was determined by the structure of a feudal, absolutist order, which, if I may borrow terms from Werner Sombart's History of Capitalism, and especially his book on the bourgeois, was essentially an economy based on expenditure, rather than one based on, ac on acquisitiveness. It was therefore quite unlike capitalism. It follows that the very meaning of that ruling class and the essence of its behavior was not to manage the economy in the same way that it would have been managed, and indeed was managed at the time by the middle class with which it was in conflict, namely in terms of balance sheets. On the other hand, however, thanks to the economic ascendancy of the middle class that I have told you about, the expenditure system of feudal absolutism was somewhat retrograde even then. It was behind the times when compared to the state of rationalization of the forces of production. When compared to that, its mode of management was irrational and was therefore a function of the general trend. What I mean to say is that this particular factor, which, which like every immediacy, is an indispensable element in triggering the universal, as I explained to you in the last few lectures, this particular factor is itself mediated by the universal which would not exist without it. In this instance, it was mediated by the development of the forces of production in the hands of the middle classes. What this tells us about the theory of history then is that taken in isolation, none of these factors would suffice to give even an, an approximate explanation of the course of history. In short, you need to grasp the complexity of the pattern by which I mean the overall process that asserts itself. The dependence of that global process on the specific situation, and then again the mediation of the specific situation by the overall process. Furthermore, in addition to understanding this conceptual pattern, you need to press forward to the concrete historical analysis I have hinted at, and that goes beyond the categories I have been discussing. I should like to conclude for today by reminding you of that celebrated transition from philosophy to historiography that is implicit in Hegel's logic and is explicitly called for in a famous passage in Marx. In all probability, the key to this transition lies in the fact that this particular configuration of categories, this dependence of the categories of historiography on actual history, is itself so much a question of categories, a conceptual process, that the traditional superficial distinction between essence and mere fact, worthless existence, as Hegel once termed it, becomes quite irrelevant. You may regard this also as a very concrete illustration of the thesis that the separation of philosophy from disciplines with the substantive subject matter cannot be sustained for reasons intrinsic to philosophy, for reasons connected with the nature and structure of categories. And this, of course, brings you onto the terrain of a philosophical turn, which I believe will have far-reaching consequences.